welcome to a new video and here I am sitting just behind the kutti I have been given by a good friend of mine in this virtual world called Second Life and today is the full moon so I thought that I should go ahead and maybe make a little dumber video for today and so I was just thinking about a topic and I didn't really know what to talk about today um, and so I, sh I was just thinking and if we it's actually the full moon today. I'm gonna just see if we can get both a glimpse of the moon. We might not be able to. Probably not. Anyway, it's not really that important. I guess. Um, so yeah, I don't think I would be doing too much of an intro just because, you know, I, I don't really know if there's actually going to be anyone watching this video, so um, I just try not to ramble too much about my own thoughts. But I kind of want to theme it around maybe the full moon and it just so happens that today, September 16th, 2016 is the day of the full moon, in my location anyway. And so I thought, what would be appropriate to read about today? And then I remembered a Dhammapada video on, I think that would be, I should look that up. So let me see which one it actually was. Might not be able to find it. Again, I'm <laughs> obviously I found out for myself. Oh, that's too far. Yeah, so I think it would be from the Mapada verse 103, probably, maybe 102, the parts where Sariputta is um, a very big part of the Dhammapada, and that's just around the verse number 100 to probably around 110. And so I think this one was from the Dhammapada verse 103, where this incredibly um, intelligent woman, uh, and sh and she was it, it's a story based on the verse, and she was incredibly intelligent and well versed in discussion on things like. It would probably have been like um, what the Brahmins were talking about at the time of the Buddha. I think she belonged to 
Oh my, maybe she didn't actually belong to any... No, I think... I'm pretty sure she did belong to some kind of Brahmin clan because I think she w she had been sent out to um, kind of representate their views and sh so she was a well, very well known uh, debater of, uh, of the time and so she would debate anyone and apparently she would uh, actually win and I thought about this uh, story because today is the full moon of the female monastics or the, the Bhikkhuni Sangha. So it would be Pinnarapoya. And I just had this interesting story come up in my mind. And the reason it was so interesting, as we're going to find out, um, it was that she had been walking around from town to town and village to village and she had this branch like uh, oh she was like from the rose apple clan or something like that so she was it had something to do with the rose apple branch and so whichever town she visited she would put it down in the earth and it would stand there, and anyone who wanted to debate her on what the topics of the Brahmins, probably like uh, how to maybe how to uh, do animal sacrifices and all kinds of very very horrible things that they did before they actually got to hear the Dhamma of the Buddha, which is still going on in the world today. I mean. You're still going to have to listen to the Dhamma to actually free yourself from these cycles. And so she was walking around with an apple, rose apple branch. And she came to a town where Sariputta was staying. And so there was some novices, young monks, uh, to be bhikkhus. And they had seen this rose apple branch, but no one dared to like pull it up from the earth because th then they would have to actually debate this woman. And they knew that she was very learned and she was very, very bright and intelligent, but she was not yet enlightened. Or I don't think she uh, had even acknowledged the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha and so she was uh, exceedingly bright uh, as a lay woman and so Sariputta he saw this rose apple branch in the dirt and said to the novices go ahead go over there and uh, and just trample it down just completely uh, walk all over it and the novices said to him but venerable sir she's going to uh, expect a debate if we do that and then Sariputta which is the Buddha's chief disciple number one he said to the novices go ahead uh, young novices go ahead and trample it down completely uh, uproot it from the dirt or the earth and so she so so they did the novices and she saw this and then she came to ask what is going on here and Sariputta was, um, no, the novices said, um, as a response to her when she said, like, what's going on here? Why are you uh, stumbling this uh, branch I've put down? And, th and then she said something like, uh, go away, because they would just be like young kids. They would just be like uh, children. And so I said, I can't debate you. You're, she didn't even consider it. And they were actually novices of the Sangha. And so, of course, Sariputta, he said, I, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, to debate you. And so she was known for having like a thousand questions, of which no one had ever before been able to answer just one. And so Sariputta, 
he went ahead and debated her and uh, so she had to go through 1000 questions which Sariputta the venerable Sariputta he would answer every single one of and so she had uh, seemingly been beaten right, in the debate because uh, no one had ever been a able to answer these questions before and I don't I don't even really know which what kind of questions she had maybe uh, probably she didn't even know herself the answer to um, some of the questions and so when Sariputta had answered all of her questions he said to her so you only have these few questions you don't have any more questions and so she said no and then Sariputta asked her well can I then ask you a question and you were going to answer me and she said uh, she responded yes she uh, would would do her best to actually then debate Sariputta and so he said Sariputta said very well what is one <laughs> and when she heard that um, she was very like she was incredibly perplexed about the um, the complexity of the, uh, the possible answers to actually what is one and so she was like I mean she was like I can't do this because you know there's so many things you could how could you ever answer what is one it could be so many things and so she was like she f she she had to say, uh, admit that she had been uh, she had been perplexed by the question for uh, sorry but uh, and so she she had to uh, say that no she she didn't know what is one and uh, I think then Sariput asked her well fine then what is two and maybe he didn't even actually go that far uh, to which she wouldn't know again what is what is two and these are like uh, questions that a novice would know so that, that that's like a child monk any novice ordained in the in the Sangha of the Buddha would know what is 1, 2, and all the way up to 10 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and this is like a uh, very very standard for novices I mean you, you have to know these uh, 10 questions to become a novice I'm pretty sure and so it was not like Sariputta was trying to uh, embarrass her or take away um, her kind of her confidence it was just that uh, it was completely useless uh, all the things that he, she had taken up and uh, held was holding on to his views like she had 1000 views right and so she asked Sariputta please venerable sir please tell me what is one and so Sariputta said uh, well you know I can't really tell you that because you you I mean you're gonna have to ordain as a novice you're gonna have to uh, join the Sangha for me to tell you what is one so I mean only novices would uh, know what is one right and she wouldn't even consider before that uh, debating a novice and so immediately she said uh, oh venerable sir please accept me into the Sangha and please uh, um, ordain me and so she was ordained and uh, she, she learned the answer and so the answer to what is one is one is that all beings subsist on food and that's the answer to one and I think that's going to be quite enough for the purposes of this video and um, if you ever want to find out all the way up to 10 what is 1 through 10 um, you should go ahead and read the Samanera Panma
uh, questions to be answered by a novice and they should be readily available for anyone interested to look up like uh, maybe a place like access to insight dot org which is the place uh, I'm going to do a little bit of reading from today and so this whole backstory is just like uh, why I'm going to read about this because you know it is a very very detailed dhamma this one and so I thought that today I want to really get into it and expand on one is what and maybe we can go through what is two and three and four and all the way up today to what is or, or ten is what what is ten um, but we're gonna have to maybe do that at a later time so today we're going to, to be looking at what is one. And as I just said, it is that all beings subsist on food. And so we're going to learn about what is food. And in the footnote here, just before we get into the actual passage I want to read today, let's see. Because this was uh, what actually uh, kind of sparked my interest in this particular question of one is what and so it says here ahara food or nutriment is of four kinds one ordinary material food kapala kapalinkarahar okay let me just try to say that one word this would be the pali word uh, the language of the buddha so it says kapalin Ra, ha, ra. I don't I don't think I w did that very well. So <laughs> I'm gonna continue on to what is oh I'm sorry. Uh the the second food out of four. And so the second type of food is contact uh of sense organs, you know, the six senses, contact. And um anyone who knows how to analyze uh, the sixth sense six sensing medium would know what I'm talking about right now and so the third kind of food is consciousness or I think he might have got it wrong here so I think the third kind is mental volition or like intent it's kind of an, a mental volition so intention and the fourth would be consciousness and so I was like hmm maybe we can go into depth and actually learn about what are these four kinds of food that all beings subsist on and so that's what we're going to be talking about today but before we do so let's just get a glimpse of the full moon and let me get up here stand and whoop let's see if I go first person there it is okay so the full moon is right above the kuti but I think we shouldn't be doing um, actual reading here just behind this is just like a place that one can sit down and look at the ocean and the islands an island and we have a great big Buddha up here and I think that we should maybe go up there and do the reading and this is the Kuti where I'm staying this one and no I'm gonna do the reading right here going to set it to listen if we're going to be listening to the Dhamma Ooh, a nice uh, Buddha right there and so I'm sitting here let me just get a bit down okay so I'm sitting here and we should get some kind of nice camera angle 
going on and then I can probably remove it should be fine I think This is what we want. Am I wrong? Should I just make it like extremely boring and go like <laughs> I pr I'm probably gonna do that? Yeah, that's my my style to be honest. So we're just gonna go like. But this is so far from boring, guys. And you can just have the nice scenery of me and my white sitting cloth and my kutti and now I'm behind bars <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm sorry I'm just joking around here okay so this is what we're gonna do and I'm, it's because I'm gonna go over to um, the text so I'm just gonna make sure that everything looks fine wanna go closer wanna go like this a little bit further closer let's be very close like so. How close can we actually get? Okay, so this is gonna be fine. So, continuing on with the four kinds of nutriment. And I'm going to be reading today a translation by Nyana Punika Terra, um, which was so kind to translate these um, texts and actually put them together uh, on the Duk group uh, under kind of a, uh, a, a gathering some text about the same uh, sub subject here, subject matter. And uh, what I'm reading from is called The Four Nutriments of Life, an anthology of Buddhist texts. And I'm probably going to put a link to the text under the video so you can look it up for yourself. I'm not going to be reading the whole part. I'm just going to be focusing on the four kinds and what they actually mean and how they could be so incredibly detailed so as to actually uh, make this incredibly bright and intelligent Brahmin make her doubt herself and I should uh, I think you should add that uh, she actually became an enlightened as an Arahat Arahant uh, probably one, one week after having entered the Sangha on the Sariputta which is incredibly admirable. Okay. So, now I'm going to start reading and by the time I stop reading that will be the end of this video. At which point I will probably just, you know, say Thank you so much for listening to me, in case there is actually anyone going to be watching this video sometime in the future. So here we go. I'm going to be putting up my hands as well as my avatar. As we are now going to read the, the, the Dhamma. So let's just uh, pay homage to the Buddha and get right into it. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. And here we go. The Four Nutriments of Life And 
this is uh, the first paragraph. This is called One Thing, and it seems that is on the Ankutta Nikaya. Monks, when a monk becomes entirely dispassionate towards one thing, when his lust for it entirely fades away, when he is entirely liberated from it, when he sees the complete ending of it, then he is one who, after fully comprehending the goal, makes an end of suffering here and now. What one thing? All beings subsist by nutriment. When a monk becomes entirely dispassionate towards this one thing, nutriment, when his lust for it entirely fades away, when he is entirely liberated from it, and when he sees the complete ending of it, then, O oh monks, he is one who, after fully comprehending the goal, makes an end of suffering here and now. Continuing on to the second paragraph here. The discourse on the sun's, the flesh of the sun, or the similes of the four nutriment. And let me just make sure I'm reading right here. Yeah, still fine. So this is from the Samyutta Nikaya. The discourse on the sun's flesh. Atsavati. There are, O oh monks, four nutriments for the sustenance of beings born and for the support of beings seeking birth. What are the four? Edible food, coarse and fine. Secondly, sense impressions. Thirdly, vol volitional thought. And fourth, consciousness. How, O oh monks, should the nutriment edible food be considered? Suppose a couple, a husband and a wife, have set out on a journey through the desert, carrying only limited provisions. They have with them their only son, dearly beloved by them. Now, while these two travel through the desert, their limited stock of provisions ran out and came to an end. But there was still a stretch of desert not yet crossed. Then the two thought, our small stock of provisions has run out. It has come to an end and there is still a stretch of desert that is not yet crossed. Should we not kill our only son, so dearly beloved? Prepare his dried and roasted meat, and eating our son's flesh, we may cross in that way the remaining part of the desert, lest all three of us perish. And two, husband and wife killed their only son, so dearly beloved by them, prepared, dried, and roasted meat, and, eating their son's flesh, crossed in that way the remaining part of the desert. And while eating their son's flesh, they were beating their breasts and crying. Where are you, our only and beloved son? Where are you, our only and beloved son? What do you think, O monks? Will they eat the food for the pleasure of it? 
for enjoyment, for comeliness sake, for uh, the body's embellishment. Certainly not, O oh Lord. Will they not rather eat the food merely for the sake of crossing the desert? So it is, O oh Lord. In the same manner, I say, O oh monks, should edible food be considered? If, O oh monks, the nutriment edible food is comprehended, the lust for the five sense objects huh so I'm gonna be saying the lust for the six sense objects uh, so we usually count thoughts as well you know as the six there are probably a couple of more senses but we're gonna stick with six senses right now are definitely not five. Um, and if lust for the six sense objects is comprehended, there is no fetter enchained by which a noble disciple might come to this world again. So the reason they're using the five sense object is maybe that uh, you know they were simpletons; they didn't really have a uh, capability of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, it could be one of the reasons, you know, usually we only use the six senses anyway. And how, O oh monks, should the nutriment sense impression be considered? Suppose, O oh monks, there is a skin cow that stands close to a wall. When the creatures living in the wall will nibble at the cow, and if the skin cow stands near a tree, then the creatures living in the tree will nibble at it. If it stands in water, the creatures living in the water will nibble at it. If it stands in the open air, the creatures living in the air will nibble at it. Wherever that skinned cow stands, the creatures living there will nibble at it. In that manner, I say, O oh monks, should the nutriment sense impression be considered? If the nutriment sense impression is comprehended, the three kinds of feeling are thereby comprehended. So, the three kinds is probably mm, something like a positive feeling, a neutral feeling, and a negative or unpleasant feeling. So we probably say like a pleasant feeling, neutral feeling, and unpleasant feeling. And let me check the footnote. It could be that I'm wrong. Yeah, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. So we're good. And let me see here. Three kinds of feeling are comprehended. And if the three kinds of feeling are comprehended, there is, I say, no further work left to do for the noble disciple. Let's look up what a noble disciple means. This refers to the attainment of sainthood. That's a bad translation, but, it, but I guess it is kind of a sainthood, although a saint is nothing like an arahant. I mean, so we shouldn't actually describe an arahant as a saint. Because a uh, saint is like a becoming, right? And an arahant is a uh, complete extinguishing of any further becoming. And uh, we could consider them to be like a perfect being. Because, you know, they can't really lie. They can't uh, harm any beings on any plane intentionally. And they are revered by gods and men. And so uh, sainthood, again, is a... Wrong, is a not translation I I would like to see for an arahant but uh, no worry let's just continue on and how O oh monks should the nutriment volition or thought be considered 
Suppose, O oh monks, there is a pit of glowing embers, filled to cover a man's height, with embers glowing without flames and smoke. Now a man comes that way, who loves life and does not wish to die, who wishes for happiness and detests suffering. Then two strong men would seize, seize both arms and drag him to the pit of glowing embers. And then, O oh monks, far away from it, it would recoil that man's will. Far away from his longing, far away from his inclination. And why? Because the man knows, if I fall into that pit of glowing embers, I shall meet death, or deadly pain, at least. In that manner, I say, O oh monks, should the nutriment volitional thought be considered. If the nutriment volitional thought is comprehended, the three kinds of craving are thereby comprehended. And what are the three kinds of craving? We can look it up here with the footnote. What does it say? Sensual craving. One, craving for eternal existence. Or just craving for existence, like a saint. Existing as a saint, that is, uh, that's a craving. So it's no good. Craving for self-annihilation. So that's also occurring, occurring not to be, right? And continuing on here. And if the three kinds of craving are comprehended, there is, I say, no further work left to do for the noble disciple. And how, O oh monks, should the nutriment consciousness be considered? Suppose, O oh monks, People have seized a criminal, a robber, and brought him before the king, saying, This is a criminal, a robber, O Majesty. Uh, meet out to him the punishment you think fit. Then the king would tell him, tell them, Go and in the morning strike this man with a hundred spears and strike him in the morning with a hundred spears at noon the king would ask his men how is that man he is still alive your majesty then go and strike him again at noontime with a hundred spears and so they did and in the evening the king asks them again how is that man? He's still alive. Then go and in the evening strike him again with a hundred spears. And so they did. What do you think, O monks? Will that man struck with three hundred spears during a day suffer pain and torment owing to that? Even if he were to be struck only by a single spear, he would suffer pain and torment owing to that. How much more if he is being struck by three hundred spears? In that manner, I say, O oh monks, should be the nutriment consciousness be considered. It is the nutriment consciousness is if the nutriment consciousness is comprehended. Mind and matter, Naman Rupa, body and mind, are thereby comprehended. And if mind and body are comprehended, there is, I say, no further work left to be done for the noble disciple. And this was from uh, Samyutta Nikaya. Okay, so this is from the Puttamans Asutta, the sun's flesh. Um, 
and then we have a commentary on the sun's flesh this is according to my perspective and you should just go ahead and read that yourself I'm not gonna go into that I'm gonna continue on and see what we can find down here and so in the third paragraph here it says the conditioned nature of nutriment and so we're continuing on from the let me just see what it was said here it's a discourse on the sun's flesh uh, which is found in the Samyutta Nikaya and uh, yeah I don't think there's uh, much more to say about that um, as we go further in the text you're going to uh, get closer to uh, where we started with Sariputta let me see mm. okay so I'm going to read this as well and I can just put up Ahara Sutta nutriment on the sun, sun Nikaya. and we're going to read this uh, what is this? This is like uh, an abridged version of the sutta. So this is part of uh, the collection on the um, in-depth look at the four nutriments. So continuing on with paragraph number three. The conditioned nature of nutriment at Sawati. There are, O oh monks, four nutriments for the sustenance of beings born and for the support of beings seeking birth. What are the four? Edible food, coarse and fine. Secondly, sense impression. Thirdly, volitional thought. And fourthly, consciousness. So this is the same thing we're going through again, um, but given uh, by the Buddha, maybe to another crowd. And continuing on. Of these four nutriments, O oh monks, what is their source, what is their origin, from what are they born, and what gives them existence? These four nutriments, O oh monks, have craving as their cause, have craving as their origin, and are born of craving and craving gives them existence and this craving O oh monks what is its source what is its origin from what is it born what gives it existence craving has feeling as its source of origin it is born of feeling and feeling gives existence to it. So craving comes by, comes around by feeling. So if you have a nice, pleasurable feeling, you might want to experience that again at a later time. And so one ends up craving for it. Continuing on. And this feeling, O oh monks, what is its source and origin? From what is it born and what gives existence to it? Feeling has sense impression as its source and origin. So, sense impression, that's kind of a contact. So when there is contact, the senses from external stimuli so that would be the external medium the feeling um, uh, originates from that and this sense impression oh monks what is its source sense impression has the sixth sense basis 
as its source of origin. And these six sense bases, oh monks. Yeah, there, there you go, right? The six senses, it's not the five senses. So, I'm sorry. And these six senses, these six sense bases, oh monks, what is their source? The six sense bases have mind and body as their source and origin. Nama, Rupa, naming and forming. And so by naming and forming, the six senses arise. And this mind and body, O oh monks, what is its source? Mind and body has consciousness as its source and origin. And this consciousness, O oh monks, what is its source? Consciousness has kamma formations as its source and origin. Kamma formations. So that is uh, essentially that is wrong view. That is the first path factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. That's right view. So it's the opposite from here. Yeah. But only an arahant, a fully enlightened being, uh, cuts this off. And these sense karma formations, karma formations. We can just call them formations, a, a formation, or like a fabrication, uh, kind of like an idea about uh, maybe an idea about self or a soul or whatever. And these formations, O oh monks, what is their source and origin? From what are they born? What gives existence to them? Kamma formations have ignorance as their source and origin. They are born of ignorance, and ignorance gives existence to them. Yeah, that's right. So I'm gonna find now something that is very complementary to what we are reading and it is from the Visuddhimagga chapter X I mean chapter fifteen. I'm just gonna look it up uh, and my in my bookmarks if I can find it. I should be able to find it very very quickly. Mm -hmm. No this is too far. That's not the one. Hmm. Was I really so stupid not actually to save that? I can't believe that. I'm sorry guys, I'm just trying to look not there's not a link. It's not a video. This is horrible. Okay, I'm gonna have to try and scroll a little bit down here. Hopefully I can find it. I mean I was just studying it not so far long ago and it's very very interesting because it's uh, linked to um, how consciousness you know is mm, how ignorance actually gives rise to consciousness and so it is part from the Visuddhimagga uh, which I'm studying right now this is like very very detailed probably not 
don't know too many humans who would actually understand um, the city marker. And so it is like incredibly dense. So dense that I didn't actually save. For some reason, I didn't save the. Hmm. It's so strange. No, this is too far. Going too far. Okay, I think I'm gonna be able to find it. Just in a second. Okay, so this is actually horrible. So I wanted to go into actually how consciousness is like the prison sentence, but uh, you know, for some reason they are not clearly organized in the way I would really, really like to have been, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why I kind of got it in my head that I had actually saved. I'm not really worried guys, I'm just gonna <laughs> look it up in the VCD mark, uh, it's probably much much easier. And so I'm gonna go do that right now. And the VCD mark is like 800 pages. I mean I don't really have anyone, any crowd around me right now, so I can just take all the time I want. <laughs> and then I can actually go ahead and, and save it. Okay, so I gotta find Jeff. What is that? That's Jeff. Oh, that's 16, right? That's too far. Chapter 14. Okay, so chapter 15. Uh huh. Ayatana tattu nitesa, the bases and elements, and this is in the Visuddhi Maka. And let's see. looking for a passage on and a footnote you know, on consciousness as to regulate I condense consciousness I'm so sorry guys um, but yeah this is uh, kind of important so I'm not really sorry so I don't want to I don't want to be not able to actually find this particular thing.
is looking around in the path of purification and looking for how it should be understood. Why can I not find it right now? Am I just too unfocused and unconcentrated? I think I am not. So I should be able to find it. F uh, Okay, so I'm gonna go here and see how far in am I now? This is but the Tanya aggregate. Oh, aggregate, right? Yeah, so go one back. Oh, wait a minute, this is still 14, so I gotta go further. 17. Wow, this is horrible. This is horrible. Chapter 14. No, no, no. I need chapter 15. Consciousness. being really selfish right now. It's not really that important. So this is another... Oh yeah. Those two guys. Mm -hmm. I think I just found it. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I can finally save this one again. And this is uh, a 221 page 489, uh, the Visuddhimaka, the path of purification. And so it speaks to the five aggregates, which we just read about, comes about as caused by ignorance. So the five aggregates are hmm, people would probably say nama, body or naming name, probably nama name. And then feeling, perception and formations and then the mind. 
on Ruben. And so, about those. 221. Also, they are respectively like the prison, the punishment, the offense, the punisher, and the offender. And they are like the dish, the food. And remember, we're just talking about food, n nutriment. And they are like the dish, the food, the curry, the sauce. Oh, sorry, the food, the curry, the sauce poured over the food, the server and the eater. This is how the exposition should be known as to simile. And so the simile here is that the five aggregates are like a prison or you know they rise based on consciousness and so the note here it says the matter of the body is like the prison and this is talking about the matter of the body not the mind matter of the body is like the prison because it is the site of the punishment perception is like the offense. So we're going through here uh, the aggregates, which is one body, and that is like the site of the punishment. So that's where the punishment happens. And then perception, number two, is like the offense because owing to perception of beauty, etc., or ugliness, saying, deeming something to be ugly or disgusting. That's also perception. Or, you know, seeing something beautiful and then craving for it because of perception, right? Because it's be beautiful. So, uh, continuing on with perception. Uh, owing to perception of beauty, it is a cause of the punishment, which is feeling. And so, they all three, three of them are here. So, perception is like the offense perceiving because owing to perception of beauty etc it is a cause of the punishment which is feeling so based on perception like perception of a self or a soul there is feeling and so there is punishment the formations aggregate is like the punisher because it is a cause of feeling and consciousness is like the offender because it is afflicted by feeling so we just had here why does consciousness arise let me read that again and this consciousness monks O oh monks, what is its source? Consciousness has comma formations as its source and origin. Right? So now we know that the formation, like uh, the wrong view, I was just talking about it, the wrong view of a soul or a self, is a cause for consciousness. And according to to the text here in the Visuddhimaka, we're going to have to repeat because I mean this is this is not this is actually not mundane. So I hope that I'm able to explain it because I mean, uh, yeah, normal human beings would probably not understand what I'm talking about. So kudos to anyone listening. It reiterates here again: matter is like the dish because it bears the food. And perception is like the curry sauce. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, going back to consciousness. Uh, consciousness is like the offender because it is afflicted by feeling. And we just learned here that consciousness has what did it has as it its origin? Ignorance, right? And so we just left off in the text on the nutriments hearing and these comma formations oh monks what is the source and origin from what are they born what gives existence to them 
come of formations have ignorance as their source and origin, and they are born of ignorance, and ignorance gives existence to them. And so, based on ignorance, there is consciousness, which was the initial reason I wanted to read this short paragraph from chapter 15, verse 2 to 1, on page 489 in the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification, and it goes just like this, about and in, re, uh, in regard to the aggregates. This is very, very detailed, so, I mean, this is awesome to actually be able to give this to anyone listening to this, because you can actually become enlightened from just by listening to this stuff. So, it goes again, 2 to 1, also they are respectively like the prison, the punishment, the offense, the punisher and the offender, and they are like the dish, the food, the curry sauce poured over the food, the server and the eater. This is how the exposition should be known as to simile. And the footnote to this stanza says, the matter of the body is like the prison because it is the site of the punishment. So, the matter of the body and the body is the first aggregate out of five. And so, starting with one, the matter of the body is like the prison because it is the site of the punishment. And what is the punishment? The punishment is feeling, either pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant feelings. Perception is like the offense, because owing to perception, uh, it is a cause of, pun of the punishment. So in perceiving, like perceiving a beautiful woman, there rises feeling, right? And feeling is like the punishment because we cannot control like uh, if we see like a something beautiful and we're not enlightened we can't actually control uh, and say I don't want to like that or if we get like uh, 300 spears into our body as we just read before uh, as the king punished uh, this this guy, we cannot actually control or switch off the pain from receiving 400 spear, uh, 300 spears to the body. And so, in this way, feeling is the punishment. Continuing on. The formation's aggregate is like the punisher because it is a cause of feeling. So, here we have that word again, the formations aggregate is like the punisher because it is the cause of feeling. And lastly, consciousness is like the offender because it is afflicted by feeling. So consciousness is afflicted by feeling and thus becomes an offender. In what way, we might ask ourselves. And again, matter is like the dish, or it was like the site of the punishment, because it bears the food. Perception is like the curry sauce, because owing to perception of beauty, etc., it hides the food. Which is feeling. So perception hides a feeling. The formation's aggregate is like the server of the food, because it is a cause of feeling, and service is included since one who is taking a meal is usually served. Consciousness 
is like the eater because it is helped by a feeling. So here we have that consciousness is like the eater. Right? So anyone who has given rise to consciousness that's like eating a dish of punishment and this is just core core Buddhism and that's also why I, I went to the length and actually took up so much time your time uh, to find this uh, very very uh, detailed exposition from the Visuddhimaka, which is also known as the path of purification. Um, so that was why I took all your time to look it up. And now I'm going to make sure that I don't be so reckless as to uh, lose this this um, passage again because it's an important passage it's not important to remember or you know uh, it's just uh, for anyone who's interested in this stuff uh, I think this one is like an awesome 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 passage to have to refer to and not misquote, obviously. Again, I'm just taking up too much of your time here, and your attention maybe, hopefully, but we never really know. Continuing on with the text, continuing from, ignorance gives existence to consciousness. Thus, O monks, through ignorance, conditioned are formations. Through the formations, conditioned is consciousness. Ah, it all makes sense now, right? Just gotta know the... Gotta do your homework. So, through consciousness, conditioned is mind and body. Through mind and body, conditioned are the six sense bases. Through the six sense bases. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. Through six sense bases, condition is uh, sense impression. Through sense impression, uh, conditioned is feeling. And through feeling, conditioned is craving. Through craving, conditioned is clinging. And through clinging, conditioned it is becoming. Be clinging to self, uh, like... Uh, that's ignorance, right? The cause for consciousness, for further becoming. Uh, the clinging condition is becoming. Through becoming conditioned is birth. Through birth conditioned are decay and death, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief and despair. Thus arises this whole mass of suffering. So let me just, for the last time, read again 
uh, from the Visuddhimagga, page 489, passage 221, uh, the path of purification, in regards to the five aggregates, uh, body, perceptions, oh, I'm sorry, body, feelings, perceptions, formations, and mind, or consciousness, which is not the mind, consciousness is not the mind. Um, also, these five aggregates, also they are respectively like the prison. So being born, everyone has the five aggregates or the six senses. And uh, Here we go. Also, they are respectively like the prison. The punishment, the offense, the punisher and the offender. And they are like the dish, the food, the curry, sauce, poured over the food, hiding the food is perception, and the food is feelings, and the perception hides the feelings just like curry sauce. The server and the eater. This is how the exposition should be known as to simile. And that's the last thing I have to say about that. Continuing on, and uh, we're also ending up here with the conditioned nature of nutriment. And this episode is going to be like way, way too long. So I'm just going to try to <laughs> make it a little bit interesting by, you know, chatting a little bit with you, the listener. And so I actually want to read like one, two, three three passages more. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and read how far into the video are we now? Like one hour and almost twenty minutes. So that's fine. I mean we could go for like three or four hours probably. Doesn't really matter. So I'm continuing on here. Uh, reading from access to insight par uh, paragraph five on the four nutriments of life. Continuing on right now. If there is lust, this was given at Savati, there are, O oh monks, four nutriments for the sustenance of beings born and for the support of beings seeking birth. What are the four? Edible food. Going over them again. Coarse and fine. Sense impression is the second. Volitional thought, the third. And consciousness is the fourth. If, O oh monks, there is lust for the nutriment edible food, if there is pleasure in it and craving for it, then consciousness takes a hold therein and grows. Where consciousness takes a hold and grows, there will be occurrence of mind and body. Nama Rupa. Rupa Nama. Uh, where the occurrence of mind and body, there is growth of kama formations, and just simply formations. Where there is growth of formations, there is a future arising of renewed existence. Where there is a future arising of renewed existence, there is future birth, decay, and death. This, I say, O oh monks, is laden with sorrow, burdened with anguish and despair. If, O oh monks, there is lust for the nutriment sense impression, volitional thought, consciousness, if there is pleasure in it and craving for it, then consciousness takes a hold therein and grows. Where consciousness takes a hold and grows, there will be occurrence of the mind and body. And there is occurrence of mind and body, there is growth of formations. Where there is growth of formations, there is a future rising of renewed existence. 
where there's future arising of renewed existence, there is future birth, decay, and death. This, I say, O oh monks, is laden with sorrow, burdened with anguish and despair. Suppose there is a dyer or a painter. Having some dye or lack, yellow, turmeric, blue, or indigo, or crimson, he would depict on a wall. Oh, I'm sorry. He would depict on a well smothered wooden table, on a wall, or a piece of cloth, the figure of a woman or a man with all the major and minor features of the body. Similarly, O oh monks, if there is lust for the nutriments edible food, sense impressional, sense impression, volitional thought and consciousness, then consciousness takes hold therein and grows. Where consciousness takes a hold and grows, there is occurrence of mind and body. Where there is occurrence of mind and body, there is growth of formations, thought formations. Where there is growth of, of formations, there is a future arising of renewed existence. Where there is a future arising of renewed existence, there is future birth, decay and death. This I say, O oh monks, is laden with sorrow, burdened with anguish and despair. But if, O oh monks, there is no lust for the nutriments, edible food, sense impression, volitional thought and consciousness, if there is no pleasure in them and no craving for them, then consciousness does not take a hold therein and does not grow. Where consciousness does not take hold nor grow, there will be no occurrence of mind and body. Where there is no occurrence of mind and body, there is no growth of formations. And where there is no growth of formations, there is no future of rising of renewed existence. Where there is no future arising of renewed existence, there is no future birth, decay and death. Now this, I say, O oh monks, is free from sorrow, from sorrow of anguish and free from despair. Suppose, O oh monks, there is a gabbled house or a gabbled hall with windows at the north, south and eastern sides. Now when a sunrise a ray a ray of the wall enters through a window, where would it find hold? On the western wall, O oh Lord. So the sun rises east. But if there is no western wall, O oh monks, where would it find a hold? On the earth, O oh Lord. And if there is no, if there were no earth, where would it find hold? On the water, O oh Lord. And if there were no water, where would it find a hold? It would not find any hold whatsoever. Mm -hmm. and the Blessed Buddha is speaking to the ceasing of matter. Similarly, O oh monks, if there is no lust for the nutriments, edible food, sense impression, volitional thought and consciousness, if there is no pleasure in them and no craving for them, then consciousness does not take hold therein and does not grow. Where consciousness does not take a hold nor grow, there will be no occurrence of mind and body. There is no growth of formations. 
where there is no growth of formations, there is no future arising of renewed existence. Where there is no future arising of renewed existence, there is no birth, decay, and death. This, I say, O oh monks, is free of sorrow, of anguish, and despair. And again, this was an excerpt for Attiraga Sutta, where there is passion. And you can go and read that as well if you want. The Atta, Atti Raga Sutta, where there is passion. You should be able to find that by checking the link I will be supplying below this video stream. And um, then you can look it up for yourself. And this uh, excerpt was from the Samyutta Nikaya. And now we have only two passages left, or paragra paragraphs left. That is one, come to be, and two, nutriment as basis of right understanding. So continuing on, paragraph number six, come to be. This has come to be. Do you see that, Sariputta? Oh, so now we're. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. I'm inter interrupting your concentration. But now we're all the way back to where we started, with uh, Buddha's chief disciple, number one, the venerable Sariputta. And listen carefully. Paragraph number six. Come to be. This has come to be. Do you see that, Sariputta? This has come to be that, O oh Lord, one sees with true wisdom as it really is. And having seen with true wisdom as it really is, that this has come to be, one is on the way towards revulsion from what has come to be, towards this passion and cessation. Produced by such nutriment that one sees with true wisdom as it really is. And having seen with true wisdom as it really is, that this has been produced by such nutriment, one is on the way towards revulsion from its production by nutriment towards dispassion and cessation. By the cessation of nutriment that what has come to be is bound to cease, that one sees with true wisdom as it really is, and having seen with true wisdom as it really is, that by the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is bound to cease. One is on the way towards revulsion from what is liable to cease and towards dispassion and cessation, Nibbana. Thus, O oh Lord, is one in higher training. And how, O oh Lord, is one a comprehender of Dhamma? This has come to be that, O oh Lord, one sees with true wisdom as it really is, and having seen with true wisdom as it really is, that this has come to be, then, through revulsion from what has come to be, through this passion concerning it, in relation to it, and the cessation of it, one is liberated without any clinging, produced by such nutriment that one sees with true wisdom as it really is, and having seen with true wisdom as it really is that this 
has been produced by such nutriment, then, through revulsion from its production by nutriment, through dispassion uh, and the cessation, one is liberated without any clinging. By the cessation of nutriment, that what has come to be is bound to cease, that one sees with true wisdom as it really is, and having seen with true wisdom as it really is, that by the cessation of that nutriment that has come to be is bound to cease, I'm sorry, that what has come to be is bound to cease, then through revulsion from what is liable to cease, from dispassion and the cessation, one is liberated without any clinging. And thus, O oh Lord, is one a comprehender of Dhamma. Well spoken, Sariputta. Well spoken, said the exalted one. Sadhu, 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 Piti. This you can read more about in the Puttamitang Sutta. This has come into being. Yeah. So if you're interested in reading up on this conversation between the Venerable Sariputta and the Lord Buddha. You should look up at access to insight.org the Buddha Mitang Sutta. You can just follow again, you can follow the link under this video and you can see all the passages from which I'm reading. And then you can press the reference, and this is from the Samyutta Nikaya SN 1231. And then you can read the whole of these suttas yourself. And finally, the last one, this is just a short one, and then we're going to end this video. And uh, let me not uh, take too much time and get right into it. So, paragraph number seven, nutriment as basis of right understanding. And so, maybe you remember that what I started talking about was right view as a path factor, as part of the path of purification or, yeah, or the Noble Eightfold Path. And right understanding would be the culmination. It might even just, you know, be how you look at it. Um, I think that uh, you could say that the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path happens in one moment. Actually, it's just one moment. And when that one moment has has passed, one has completely changed. And uh, yeah. This is uh, to be seen for oneself. And so, ending off this video now, from where we started, path vector one, right view, and ending off with paragraph number seven from the gathering of these texts on the four nutriments of life by Nyana Punika Terra on access to insight. I'm now going to read the last paragraph and we're going to end this video it was about time I think so here we go nutriment as basis of right understanding or as a simile as you eat so you become here we go then the monks put another question to the venerable Sariputta friend. Could there be another way in which a noble disciple can be said to be one of right understanding, whose view is upright, who is possessed of steadfast confidence in the Dhamma, who has attained to this good teaching? There could be, friends. If, friends, the noble disciple knows nutriment, 
knows the origin of nutriment, knows the ceasing of nutriment, and knows the way leading to the ceasing of nutriment, then he is in so far one of right understanding, whose view is upright, who is possessed of steadfast confidence in the Dhamma, who has attained to this good teaching. And what is nutriment? There are four kinds of nutriment for the sustenance of beings born and for the support of beings seeking birth. What are the four? One, edible food, coarse and fine. Two, sense impression is the second. Volitional thought is the third. And consciousness is the fourth. Consciousness. Through the origin of craving, there is origin of nutriment. Through the ceasing of craving, there is ceasing of nutriment. The way leading to the ceasing of nutriment is the Noble Eightfold Path, namely right understanding, right thought, okay, okay, so wait a minute, let me see here, right understanding, so if he puts this in this way, so he actually translates right view to be right understanding, which I don't think is proper, because understanding is different from view. Right view leads to right understanding. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do my own translation right quick here, so, because we're not going to say that you know, right understanding comes about through the culmination of the Eightfold Noble Path. And uh, um, right concentration. So right understanding, you know, it, it's a thing that comes about when you have right concentration and you're no longer focusing on this and that. Okay, so let me read here. Through the origin of craving, there is origin of nutriment. Through the ceasing of craving, there is ceasing of nutriment. The way leading to the ceasing of nutriment is the Noble Eightfold Path, namely right view, Okay, so let me just find my own little thing here. I don't like this translation given here. Okay, here we are. I'm going to read about the path factors here. Samaditi, complete or perfect vision, view, also translated as right view or right understanding. Vision of the nature of reality and the path of transformation. Right view about the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sankha. That's all you need. Samma Sankapa. Here. The perfected emotion of aspiration, also translated as right thought or attitude. Liberating emotional intelligence in your life and acting from love and compassion. An informed heart and feeling mind that are free to practice letting go. So it seems, uh, let me just correct myself that people actually do translate right view to right understanding, which is suboptimal for the meaning of the words. And I think right thought, that should be right intent. 
Samma Vakya Perfected or whole speech Also called right speech Clear, truthful, uplifting and non-harmful communication And the path back to four Or the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry The fourth uh, factor here Samma Kamantana Integral action Right action Also called right action Yeah an ethical foundation for life based on the principle of non-exploitation of oneself and others. And this also includes the five precepts. Panchasila. And number five. Sama Ajiva. Proper livelihood. Also called right livelihood. This is a livelihood based on correct action, the ethical principle of non-exploitation, the basis of an ideal society. And number six, Samma Vayama, complete or full effort, energy or vitality, also called right effort or diligence. Consciously directing our life energy to the transformative path of creative and healing action that fosters wholeness conscious evolution samasati complete or thorough awareness also called right mindfulness developing awareness if you hold yourself dear watch yourself well yeah, so watching yourself being a little bit more complicated than some but it's a nice simile I like this translation where they actually include um, in-depth explanations and um, still at uh, right mindfulness levels of awareness and mindfulness of things oneself feelings thoughts perceptions people reality formations consciousness complete or thorough mindfulness about everything even visiting the toilet being mindful while visiting the toilet being mindful throughout life in everything we do and number eight Samma Samadhi full integral um, or perfect Samadhi this is often translated as concentration meditation Absor absorption none of these translations are adequate I agree with this um, th this is awesome I completely agree uh, Samadhi literally means to be fixed absorbed or in or established at one point thus the first level of meaning is concentration when the mind is fixed on a single object the second level of meaning goes further and represents the establishment not just of the mind but also of the whole being in various levels of modes of consciousness and awareness. This samadhi in the sense of enlightenment or Buddhahood. And then it just has a, a note down here. It says uh, it's about the word samma because you know it. Sama Ditti, Sama Sankapa, Sama Vacha, Sama Kamanta, Sama Ajiva, Sama Vayama, Vayama, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. And so it says here, the word Sama means proper, whole, or thorough, integral, complete, and perfect. Related to English, it means summit. It d does not necessarily mean right as opposed to wrong. How, however, it is often translated as right, which can send a less than accurate message. For instance, the opposite of right awareness is not necessarily wrong awareness. It may simply be incomplete awareness. Uh, use of the word right may make for a neat consistent list of qualities in translations uh, the downside is that it can give the impression that the path is narrow and moralistic approach to the spiritual life 
if I use variant in variant interpretations so you consider the depth of meanings, what do these things mean in your life right now? Okay, so one who is uh, not uh, afraid of speaking out on bad translations, I have to give uh, I have to give, um, what is that called, like, uh, kudos to this guy, John Allen, it seems his name is. And I was just reading about these path factors over from Buddhist studies at uh, buddhanet.net, uh, another great resource for uh, Buddhist texts. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to save this uh, window here so I can link to this as well. And we're at the very end, friends. Just one more uh, stanza here, or like a verse, and then we're done. So, we just heard about the way leading to the ceasing of nutriment is the Noble Eightfold Path. And then we had just a quick uh, back and forth on translations. And just to, you know, give the whole aspect and not just... Uh, this is not even this is not what I think it should be now. I'm giving you what they think and then I'm giving you what I think and then you can consider uh, which one is mm, which one is better. So finishing off here. Friends, if a noble disciple less knows nutriment, knows the origin of nutriment, the ceasing of nutriment and the way leading to the seizing of nutriment. He entirely abandons the inner tendency to lust. He casts off the inner tendency to ill will. Eliminates the inner tendency to the opinion and conceit of I am. He discards ignorance, produces knowledge and becomes an ender of suffering here and now. Majimini Kaya Namah Narayan. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And without taking too much more of your time, um, let me just say a quick thank you to anyone, oops, to anyone who uh, who listens, <laughs> who actually listened here, and let me just take my hands up and salute it, or like, uh, and I give you my wishes of all the best, and may you find true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering in this way. And thank you so much for listening, and I hope. I didn't take too much of your time and if you think that it was worth listening to and you learned something please feel free to share or like or comment and if you have serious comments I will answer e every one of them every one I can get to and so probably all of them as it is right now because I mean I don't really know if anyone in the immediate future is going to be listening to this talk so please feel free to comment and ask questions and subscribe to my channel for more content. And if you didn't get enough in this sitting, I mean, we can see here now that this is almost a two hour session. This is one minute and fifth, one hour and 50 second. I'm oh, sorry, 50 minutes. So I'm just gonna make it a complete two hours by doing 10 minutes of meditation and so I should stand and then I should oops not press my hair that was, and then I should go to meditate and then I can sit back down and now I want to get the camera controls up get a little bit down like this I'm off a little bit right so I'm gonna do this 
and then we should do 10 minutes of vipassana meditation together and then i'm going to end the stream right after that so let me just set my timer and i will try to make this video exactly two hours long so i'm going over to the meditation site i have a great community so i can log my 10 minutes of meditation so all my dhamma friends can see that i'm meditating right now as well and we have eight minutes okay so it's going to be eight minutes of sitting meditation and please join me in doing eight minutes of meditation right now
And that was the timer for the eight minutes of meditation. And so I'm just going to finish off here by once again saying thank you. Thank you for meditating with me here today. And have a great full moon. And have many, many questions.